It's Yasmin Mujahid, and you're listening to Serenity streaming live on One Legacy Radio. So today's topic is um, one of my favorite topics, actually. Um, it's the it's the topic of love of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and the reason why uh, it's one of my favorite topics is because everything that we do uh, in this life and everything uh, basically uh, should revolve around this particular station um, on the path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we have talked about in the past, I mean, we talk about things like trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We talk about um, trust meaning, uh, you know, tawakkul, having full reliance on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We talk about, uh, you know, humility. We talk about uh, these con- the concept of rida, for example, the concept of um, sabr, you know, rida meaning contentment with the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, sabr, patience, perseverance. All of these, um, you know, all of these different stations on the path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they either lead up to the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or they are a result of the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So everything else, every other station uh, leads us or or is a means to get to the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or it is um, a fruit of that, of that love. And if we, you know, a lot of times we as believers and, you know, we might get to a point where we want to uh, devote our lives, you know, to becoming better. We want to uh, strengthen our deen. We want to better ourselves. And a lot of times what keeps us from taking that path is that it looks really hard. It looks like it's a very, you know, from the outside, when you look at, uh, sometimes from the outside, when you look at Islam, all you see is, oh, you know, like everything's haram, it's too hard. You know, it's a lot easier to just not be religious. And there's this deception um, that people have about uh, what it means to devote your life to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the truth is that uh, if you really want to take the easiest path uh, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it really is this path. It's the path of love. And when I say that, what I mean is that um, if you think about the example of, of another human being, that uh, what what happens if you compare, uh, you know, like how you are, what, you know, how difficult it is to be kind and giving and uh, generous when you love someone versus when you don't love them. So if you think of an example in your own life uh, of a person in your life who is very dear to your heart, someone who you absolutely love, um, maybe more than anyone else in the world. And then you think about how easy it is to, uh, to, to give to that person, how easy it is to sacrifice for that person. And, and sometimes you'll even be willing to give up your own comfort for the sake of their comfort. And, and sometimes you'll just, um, you, you'll sacrifice your own happiness to make them happy. And this is something that when you really love someone isn't even very difficult to do. It's just sort of a natural consequence of love. And if you compare that to a situation where you don't really love the person, but you sort of feel obligated uh, to the person, and it's a lot harder. At that point, sacrificing is much more difficult. Uh, You're basically going to just do the minimum for that person. You're not going to go above and beyond for that person because you don't really love them. I mean, you don't have that that regard for them. And so to give to them is a struggle. And it's it's especially difficult if it means self-sacrifice. But if you go back to the example of the one who you love, and, and especially if you're in love with someone, is that is that when you're at that point, it becomes very easy. It becomes easy to not only give to that person, but it becomes very easy to remember that person. And in fact, uh, if you think about a situation where someone is in love, it's not like they have to be reminded of the one that they love. It's like kind of like they have to get some, you know, you need help to stop thinking about the one you're in love with, not the other way around. And so when you, when you think about the concept of love, love is a very, very strong motivator. And so when we, when we look at how do we approach the path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how do we approach this path to bettering ourselves or getting closer to him or, you know, in quotation marks, being more religious. And really, I think that unfortunately, a lot of us go about it in the wrong way. And even as children, um, I think we're taught as children, so much of what we're taught about Islam as children has to do with, oh, you're going to go to hell if you don't do this, right? You have to do this. This is haram. This is haram. And this is haram. So everything, you know, the, the image that, that that's created as children for us, sometimes in Sunday school and 
and all that is that everything is haram and I better not do it because if I do it, I'm going to go to hell. And so the, I think the, the big mistake in, in seeing Islam in this way is that it has nothing to do with love of Allah. It just has to do with, you know, just trying to get myself out of hellfire. You know, just the idea of thinking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in such a way that, you know, his attributes, which are more em- most emphasized, are not emphasized in this way. When you just talk about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's wrath and you just talk about hellfire, you start to see a skewed and very inaccurate picture of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I've seen a lot of times where children grow up in that way, where they're taught in this way, and it really just turns them off from the whole idea of being religious at all. And sometimes it completely turns them off from Islam. And it and it's like it, until and a lot of times people, it's not until like they get they grow up and they go to college and sometimes in their MSAs they'll come back to Islam. But it's kind of like I've seen this pattern a lot where as children, because of the way they're taught about who Allah is and and how we're supposed to worship Him, and it's so much of it is out of fear. So much of it is uh you know this this image of of a very wrathful type of God who is, you know, he's going to punish you unless you do X, Y, and Z. And and so people get very turned off by that. And and then, you know, a lot of times, you know, alhamdulillah, through their MSAs, they start to see the other side of Islam and, and really the other side of God. And, and in fact, this is the most emphasized side of God. And so it's extremely dangerous to take that out of the whole equation. Now, when we when we think back to the idea of love, we, you know, going back to the example of when you feel like, you know, you really love somebody and, and when you are in that, you know, state, again, everything you do for that person becomes much, much easier. It becomes very easy to remember that person and it becomes very easy to sacrifice and give to that person. When we love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the worship that we do and the commitment that we make to him becomes much, much easier Because we love him and we want to please him and we want to be with him. And so really that is the strongest motivator and it needs to be our strongest motivator. Um, In the example that was given um, is, you know, a lot of times people become sort of paralyzed by having either too much hope or having too much fear in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, or of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so what we're told to have is we have to have a balance between the fear and the hope where we, you know, we fear, for example, when we are, you know, um, when we are committing sins, we should fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's anger. And that's part of taqwa. Uh, But at the same time, we should not allow that fear to paralyze us because if that fear paralyzes us, we're not going to be able to change. We're not going to be able, we end up falling lower and lower and lower. And so what we have to do is let that fear actually drive us to get better, but not paralyze us. And the way to do that is to balance it with hope because hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, anytime that I am committing sins, I should not lose that hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive me. Uh, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us all of these attributes of his, which have to do with forgiveness and for you know, and and love. And, um, you know, the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-jabbar, for example, which means one of the meanings of this attribute is the one who mends. And so if I'm, you know, if I'm broken or I am, you know, my, my deeds are by definition insufficient, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can mend them. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most generous. So, even when I'm, you know, I'm giving him, you know, a very insufficient ibadah, very insufficient worship, and yet he still gives and gives and gives of his gifts to me. And that's because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most generous and not because I deserve it. So inshallah, we'll take a short break now. And when we return, we'll continue on the topic of love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala.
Assalamu alaikum. This is Yasmin Mujahid, and you're listening to Serenity, streaming live on One Legacy Radio. Uh, so before we return to the topic of love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I had a request on the chat box uh, to sort of give an inspirational message for students. I guess a lot of students are dealing with midterms right now, and that's a stressful thing. Um, you know, I remember when I was a student. Uh, and it's interesting, actually, one really short, quick reflection about that is um, I know that when I was a student and I had an exam coming up or I got a bad grade on an exam or, or whatever happened, I remember... At the moment that it was happening, I thought it was like the biggest deal in the world, you know, like, oh, my God, I have an exam tomorrow or oh, I did really bad or what are what are my grades and this and that. And, and, and it becomes like very, very important. And it's something that you focus so much on and you're sort of it's it becomes sort of your whole world at, at that moment. And um, I'll just say this, that like once you are out of that moment, so many years later, you look back and it like totally didn't matter as much as you thought it did at the moment. <laughs> so I just kind of want to give that reflection, having gone through it and then looking back that 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 particular moment where I was freaking out about a test or I got it, you know, in, in the grand scheme of things, it mattered very little to none. So um, I'm not saying that, you know, you don't do your best, you do your best. Um, but I am saying that, you know, um, really like you do your best, but you just kind of are able to step outside of it and realize that it really isn't the, um, you know, the beginning and end of the world. It's, it's, it's something that you're doing and then inshallah it'll, it'll pass. Uh, but basically um, what I would say for advice uh, about, you know, um, Anything that you do, basically, um, whether you're studying or you're working or anything that you're focused on or working at in this dunya is just to make sure that your focus is clear and that your intentions are clear. Because the Prophet ﷺ told us that the way I mean, he basically gave us a, a prescription to be successful in this life as well as the next life. And that prescription is to actually make your primary concern and your focus not on this life. So when you're going in and you're taking a test um, or you're studying or you're, you know, you're working on your, you know, whatever degree it is, uh, it, you're doing that. But your end, your goal is not about dunya. Your goal and your end should not be just to get that degree or just to make a certain salary or, you know, to have a certain prestige in society. But your goal should be bigger than that and greater than that and, and, and better than that. And that is for the hereafter. And if you make that your goal and you make that your primary concern and where your focus is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make your matters easy for you. Um, and this is based on the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu where he talks about the difference between the person who makes the dunya his primary concern versus the one who makes akhira, um, hereafter his primary concern. And, and the one who makes the primary concern and the goal and the focus akhira, the hereafter, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually will join and, and make easy your affairs in this life. So always just remember, you know, your priorities. One, one you know, thing I want to point out is sometimes we don't get involved enough in uh, things that, that will bring us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, such as like study circles or, um, you know, going to lectures or just basically being involved in these things because we have to study or because we have, you know, we're, we're, we have all these commitments at school and while obviously you're not you're not supposed to abandon your commitments at school, but if you realize like if you always put make it a priority uh, to put Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first, you will find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will put barakah, will put blessing in your even in your study time. And 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 you can be able to do things in less time than you would otherwise. Um, if you make Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the priority. So I it's just, you know, some reflections to think about, you know, um, it is very important that you are involved along with your school with some consistent activity, which is which is keeping you and bringing you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, some type of dhikr, some type of um, consistent halakha, for example, or something that, that you do regularly that I cannot overemphasize, um, you know, that point. It's extremely important. We cannot build our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala based on just sporadic, um, you know, uh, you know, things that just, um, you know, we go to a lecture here, we go to, you know, we listen to something on YouTube once or, but it needs to be consistent. Just like you need to consistently eat food in order to stay alive. You need to consistently have these remembrance. You need to consistently be working on your heart, um, in order to, to keep it alive. So back to the, I mean, to the topic of, 
of hope and fear and then love. Uh, there's a really beautiful statement of Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah, in which he says, on his way to Allah, a believer's heart is likened to a bird. Love is its head. Fear and hope are its wings. Hence, when the head and wings are sound, the bird will perfectly fly. If the head is cut, the bird will die. And when he loses the wings, he will be inevitably objected to hunting. It's so like, subhanAllah, Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, man. So <laughs> he, he's talking here about a concept. I mean, it's just, yeah, it's, it, it's deep. So, so here, if you, talk, if you think about, he's talking about that the head of the bird is love. So what is it that leads the bird? It's love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is what should be driving us. This is what should be leading us in our path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the wings, if you think about the wings now, what happens if one side of the wing is broken um, and, and or weaker than the other side? Well, what happens now is the bird isn't um, as stable. And so it's more likely to be shot down. And this is a perfect analogy. If you think about a person who who has too much fear, for example, and not enough hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you have too much fear, this is where you get a, a situation of like, um, well, I'm going to go to hell anyway. What's the point? <laughs> you know, people say s s things like that. Like, um, you know, what's the point? No matter what I do, um, I'm going to get punished. Or no matter what I do, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sin. Or no matter what I do, I'm going to fail. So what's the point in trying? It's, it's this loss of hope because the fear is too strong and the hope is too weak. And if you look at that situation, now that person who has that mindset, are they motivated to really act? They're not. And that's because they don't have that proper balance. Now, if you look at the other side of it, where you have too much hope and not enough fear, when you have too much hope, th this could be a situation where it's um, kind of like, I can do whatever I want and um, I'm still going to be saved in the end. Right? It doesn't matter because I can, you know, you, you, you kind of have... Um, too much wishful thinking where you think that I can do whatever I want, um, act however I want. And then, you know, it's kind of the idea uh, of I can live my life however I want. And then before I die, I'll just say, la ilaha illallah, and then I'll be fine. Um, but the problem with this thinking is that at the time of death, for example, the only thing that you're going to be able to speak with your tongue is what's filling your heart. And so if your heart is you know, you lived your entire life just living for dunya and loving dunya and, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was not in your heart. Guess what? He's not going to be on your tongue when you're dying because your tongue is going to speak what's in the heart. And so whatever your heart was attached to, that's what comes out at the time of death. And it's so interesting and rather very, it's actually very scary to look at people um, when they're dying, to look at what they say and how they act and there are times, and I'm sure many of us have heard of these cases where people at the time of death, they can't say la ilaha illallah. They're not able to. People around them keep telling them, say la ilaha illallah, repeat, you know, repeat after me, say la ilaha illallah. And they're not able to say it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not, that person will not be allowed to say la ilaha illallah unless they had la ilaha illallah in their heart, unless that's what they lived. So what you live and what you carry inside is what, what you're going to end up seeing and what you're going to end up speaking at the time of death. So the, so the whole idea of the bird is that it needs to be balanced, that the love and the fear, I'm sorry, the hope and the fear need to be balanced and the love needs to drive the person. This is really what ultimately what, I, what drives me is my love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that I want to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I want to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala having him be pleased with me. And so on the topic of love, I want to I want to actually mention a couple of hadith where the where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the issue of love of 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 Allah for the the slave and for and the love of the slave for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now this is a hadith that I really really love um where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that when Allah loves a servant he calls Jibreel and says, I love so-and-so, so love him. And then Jibreel loves him. Then he, Jibreel, announces in the heavens, saying, Allah loves so-and-so, so love him. Then the inhabitants of the heavens, so the angels, also love him. And then the people on earth love him. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't love someone, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dislikes someone, thus he also starts 
to dislike him. Then the people object. Then, then the people become the object of hatred on earth as well. So here the hadith is, you know, this is, and this is Bukhari and Muslim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying here that when, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has hub, has love for, for a person, he actually tells, I mean, imagine the, the honor of having Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala love you, that he tells Jibreel alayhi salam to love you. And then Jibreel alayhi salam tells the angels uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves you. And so they love you. And then the, the people on the earth love you. This is a consequence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's love. Now, the question now should be, um, well, how do we get the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How do we, you know, how do we get this, this amazing, you know, th- acquire this station where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves us? And there's a hadith which talks about this exact question um, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's a hadith Qudsi. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that um, there is no, there is no action um, that, uh, that, uh, that a slave gets close to him except by which is more beloved than those things which he has made obligatory. So the first part of this hadith is saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that, that the thing, the action that Allah loves most in order to get close to him are those actions which are actually fart, those actions which are obligatory. Now, I just want to make a quick reflection on this on this issue. A lot of times what we find in ourselves and and, and people around us is that when we when we take this path and we want to start to be more religious and and you know um you know basically make the deen more important in our lives, sometimes we we kind of overlook the fundamentals and we go for like these extra things. So, this is a situation where a person might be Okay, they're very like excited and, you know, they're, they're on this high and so they want to get very involved, for example. So they might be involved in all these committees at the masjid and, and involved in activism and, you know, they're, they're kind of like pumped, right? I want to work for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, but then at the same time, their salah is not really in order or maybe, um, you know, they're involved in all these activities, but they don't wake up for fajr. This is a situation where we have overlooked what is fart, what is obligatory and we've gone to the to the things which are which are extra than no effort. And and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is explaining here that you start with the fundamentals, you start with the with the obligatory. And the reason why you start there is because that's what Allah loves most. Because that's what he made for. You see, like we we sometimes overlook these things as if they're, you know, just oh, you know, that's just it's lesser because it's far. But what we forget to realize is the reason he's made it obligatory is because that's the action he loves most. So when he says you pray Fajr at a certain time, when he says you pray these, you know, these five prayers at this time, you know, the fasting and the, and the zakat and, and these things, he has made those things obligatory for a reason. Um, those are the things which are most beloved to him. And those are the things which will um, cure us and which will, will make our hearts healthy most. So that's, this is kind of like, the medicine, this is the strongest medicine and the best medicine to take is the things that he has made obligatory. And then after that, uh, the hadith goes on to say, and then my servant continues to draw near to me by the things which I have made, uh, the extra things, the voluntary things. And so here now we're talking, so after you've done the fara'id, you've, you've settled, you know, you've gotten and you've you, you have the fundamentals down. Then you continue to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through adding the extra things. This is where you add, you know, the extra prayers, the extra fasts, getting involved in the community, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then after this, something amazing happens. And that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, until I love him. So now this is the point where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now loves the servant. And once Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves a servant, he says, I become his hearing with which he hears, his sight with which he sees, and his hand with which he strikes, and his feet with which he walks. And if he asks me something, I will surely give him. And if he seeks my protection, I will surely protect him. This hadith is like powerful. This hadith (laughs) talks about, this hadith talks about this process of getting to a point where not only do we love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves us. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves a servant, even his, his hearing and his seeing and his hand becomes a reflection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That everything this person does is reflecting of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's light. 
And so this is the, I mean, this is the station that we, you know, we seek and we, and we, we wish inshallah that we can reach. And this is the way to reach it. It is through, you know, making sure that we have the fundamentals down, the fara'id down, and then inshallah continuing to add extra things and until we get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves us. And and I want to inshallah just end with the with uh, another ayah of the Quran which links the two, the love that we have for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then the love that he has for us. And that is the ayah that says, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم قل إن كنتم تحبون الله فاتبعوني يحببكم الله ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم. This is an ayah where um, the Prophet Sallallahu is told to say to the people, if you truly love Allah, then follow me. And then Allah will love you and forgive your sins. So this is, this is chapter 3 verse 31. Now here you see the link. First, Allah is saying, you know, to tell the prophet, to tell us that if, so the first part of it is we love Allah. If we really love Allah, then this is what we should do. We should follow the prophet. We should follow his sunnah. We should, we should follow his way um, and his example. And once we do that, now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will love us back and he will forgive our sins. أَقُولِ قَوْلِ هَذَا وَاسْتَغْفِرَ اللَّهِ وَلَكُمْ إِنَّ غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ سبحانك الله وبحمدك نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته